I'm Mike McCullough at the University of Miami. I'm a professor of psychology and I direct the Laboratory for Social and Clinical Psychology. Evolutionary scientists talk about several things that could have driven the evolution of religion. One possibility is that it really didn't evolve to do anything and that religion is kind of a byproduct of the way the mind was simply designed to work to solve other problems. So for example, we know that the mind comes ready-made, the human mind comes ready-made to detect agency out in the world. So we have a bias cognitively to assume that when we see objects in motion that there are forces that push them into motion. So we see the clouds moving and we think there must have been something going on to get those clouds moving. Uh, when we see bad weather, consequently, we think there must have been some force that caused this bad weather. We see cause as the way the mind just naturally was designed to perceive the world. So when you think about what religion really involves, it's seeing agency, seeing cause in things that don't necessarily have causes you can readily make sense of. So it seems an easy reach to a lot of scientists to think, well, if we naturally tend to attribute weather to causes or bad luck to causes or a drought to, uh, to causes or the death of a loved one to causes, then it's probably pretty, um, pretty difficult for us not to assume that there's some person out there making these events happen. And so in some ways, religion may simply be a byproduct of our, the way our minds were designed to work. So that's really one important possibility. The mind is hardwired to see agency out in the world, and we therefore assume there are beings and spirits and gods out there that think and act a lot like we do, that, that make good and bad things happen out in the world. But once you've got that ability to posit gods and spirits, out in the universe making things happen that we care about, then that religious belief becomes available to do other things that might be really useful for humans who live in these small groups, uh, who work together to solve common problems and uh, kind of get through life. So one of the things we're talking about a lot is the possibility that believing in a religious faith facilitates cooperation among non-relatives. So if you look at the last hundred thousand years for sure of human civilization, human societies, what you notice is that we've become very good at cooperating with each other, at um, teaming together to solve important problems that we couldn't solve if we were just relying on our family members. So we build cities, we, uh, we farm land, we create armies to defend ourselves. We get together to care for children in a cooperative manner. Um, we hunt large game cooperatively. And all of these cooperative dilemmas require that people are willing to pitch in and uh, work together even though pitching in requires costs. I mean, if you think about it, you might be better off not cooperating with a bunch of people and instead in the short term just going it on your own trying to solve your problems on your own because you don't have to sort of water down your efforts by contributing to, to everybody else's. So we think about cooperation as being one of the things that religious belief might be very good at uh, helping humans to do. And also sort of something we've been exploring um, which, is, which is related but in some ways also quite distinct is the possibility that religion has uh, evolved in part to facilitate the exercise of self-control. Because if you think about all of these dilemmas that humans have faced in the last hundred thousand years, a lot of them actually have to do with exercising self-control. For example, um, we know that farming was uh, a response to a big population explosion and essentially we had to start farming in order to feed all of the mouths that were running around. But farming is very intensive work. It requires a huge contribution of effort on the front end. Um, it's much more work on the front end than simply foraging and hunting on your own. It's, it's, the, it's really, you know, as the Bible says, it's by the sweat of your brow that you, that you farm. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not something you'd choose if you were looking for the easiest ways to feed yourself. But it seems to have been very, very critical to um, 
to individual families success in feeding all the mouths. Um, so there were probably was very strong pressure to develop self-control, this kind of inner capacity that would allow you to forego short rewards, small rewards in the short term, in order to um, succeed in obtaining larger rewards in the long term. And, and farming is really very, very typical of that kind of self-control dilemma, right? Um, so we think that through the evolution of self-control and religion's ability to help people control themselves because they see these gods looking down on them, these spirits looking down on them, telling them that they, they need to um, not be selfish, they need to, not, uh, they need to think about the long-term consequences of their behavior. This would have actually helped people extend their natural self-control capabilities and therefore thrive at things like agriculture or even in working together with other people, uh, avoiding that temptation to, de to defect, that temptation to be selfish. Um, Self-control turns out to be really important for that, and we think that the idea that there are these gods or spirits looking down on you and possibly judging your behavior might have been really, really useful for helping people to prop up their self-control capabilities. And that's what we've been exploring, is this possibility that what religion is very good at doing, and possibly why it evolved, is to help ancestral humans that were on their way to becoming modern to extend their abilities to control themselves and not engage in impulsive behavior that might have been beneficial in the short term but less desirable than other uh, courses of behavior would have been in the long term.